Okay, hello and welcome to Dr. Futamura's projection machine, from interpreters to compilers through a marvelous device. So, uh, I guess uh, most of you will be familiar with GraalVM. It's, uh, it's actually an umbrella of different technologies, known probably today mostly for native image capabilities, but uh, it's a lot more than that. It's a just-in-time compiler. And the thing that we're gonna talk to about today not specifically, but the theory behind that. It's a project that's called Truffle that allows you to run on top of the JVM all of these interesting languages, not just Java or Scala or Groovy or whatever, but also JavaScript, Ruby, R, Python, even C and C++, and uh, yeah, a number of other languages. You can even write your own, yeah. So it is a pretty interesting piece of technology, and the most interesting part, this is an old paper, so probably numbers have changed, but um, the interesting thing is that it allows you to write uh, an, the implementation for a programming language in a very high-level way, and it will still give you performance that are comparable or possibly better that their native original implementation. Consider, for instance, Ruby or, or JavaScript, which is comparable. At the time, it was very comparable to V8. Probably now it's even better. So, interesting uh, project. So, uh, we're going to go through the theory, but I don't want to, uh, you know, making, making you sleep. I mean, it's four. You've been through a lot of talks already. Uh, I hope that you will enjoy this. But I want to just mention a couple of, of papers here. Allocation removal by partial evaluation and tracing JIT. Um, the abstract talks about how it is complicated to, to do uh, properly uh, the implementation of specifically dynamic languages. So, languages that are typed uh, at runtime, basically. Um, and so they present compiler optimization based on online partial evaluation. So what's partial evaluation? There's another paper here, which is more, um, even more related, practical partial evaluation for high-performance dynamic language runtimes. And even here, it tells you that most high-performance dy dynamic language virtual machines need to duplicate the language semantics in order to be efficient. So you imagine you have your, you know, I don't know, a JavaScript interpreter, a Python interpreter, and you want it to be, you want it to be fast. So what you do, um, you usually start off with an interpreter, and your interpreter, it's a Okay, but it's uh, just like the JVM, you know, it starts with an interpreter for the bytecode, but then you recognize that it's not fast enough. So as, as, long as, as soon as you have enough information, you want to transform that uh, first representation into a compiled representation and then run that immediately. Now, in order to have both an interpreter and a just-in-time compiler, you have to duplicate a lot of the semantics in the interpreter and the compiler. So the objective here is, was to use partial evaluation um, in order to, to av avoid having that kind of, of repetition. So they present a way to make it practical. And they implement language semantics using something <laughs> uh, by deriving the interpreter from the, the, the interpreter directly the compiler uh, using a technique that's called partial evaluation, using a technique that was known as first Futamura projection. 1983 is the year of that paper, and we're going to go through a part of this paper. Uh, so a, a few words just about me. My name is Eduardo Vacchi, uh, Evacchi on the internet. You can find me on Twitter and also now on Mastodon. Uh, I did programming language research at the University of Milan, um, and uh, then I did a little bit of research and development at the Unicredit Bank. I worked for five years at Reddit, at Rules, Cogito, especially uh, CodeGen stuff, and then now I'm working at a company called Tetret, um, that is doing <laughs> interesting product, but in particular, I'm working on WZero, which is a zero dependency web assembly runtime for Go developers. So I know you are Java developers. I used to be a Java developer. We're a safe space here. <laughs> Anyway, uh, WebAssembly is an interesting piece of technology. If you want to know more uh, or you would like to know more and why I think it's interesting in the back end and not the front end, just ask me later. Okay, this talk is loosely based on this other talk by uh, Tom Stewart. It was presented at RubyConf 2013 and it was called Compilers for Free. I've stolen a lot of pictures from there. And, uh, so if you want to look at it, uh, it's a very nice talk. This is the paper from, the original paper from uh, Yoshihiko Futamura. Um, it, the, the idea is to clarify, he was, he was saying, the, the idea is to clarify the difference between partial and ordinary, ordinary computation. Um, 
we will go through this. And there are two points. Uh, describe what a partial computation compiler here at the bottom and a tabulation technique that we're not going <laughs> to look at today. So programs and programming languages. What are programs? Programs are, are a sequence of, so I know that you know what programs are, of course, but I'm going to take a step back and just reason about the definitions just to, you know, be on the same page because we're going to use this definition later. So we call a program a sequence of instructions that can be executed by a machine. All, all good so far. Uh, of course, the machine could be virtual or it could be physical, and there's no particular uh, difference between the two in an abstract sense. Um, we will say that a program gets evaluated, so assume that there is some machine that is able to interpret that program. So what is program evaluation? Let's say you have a program, let's call it P, and it has some instructions, and then you have some input data for the program P. And uh, by evaluating P over D, you get the result, recall, let's call it R. Okay, that's really basics, okay? So we evaluate P over D and produces some output result R. Let's say that our program is a program, very very basic program that computes uh, sum. So uh, it has two parameters, two inputs, K and U, and the body is K plus U. Uh, we bind K to three, uh, U to four. K plus U gives us, yeah, I know you read the solution, so. <laughs> What about interpreters? Well, an interpreter, it's a program. So that's important. So an, inter an interpreter takes a program as its input and the input to that program and then evaluates that program and gives you the result. So it's a, it's a program that takes another program as an input, but also takes the input for that program and then gives you back the result. So if the program is P, the data is D, then I evaluates uh, P over D and gives you back R. And we could denote this by saying IPD, okay? So far, I don't think I've lost anybody yet, okay? <laughs> All right, let's say uh, that we have an interpreter for some, for some language, some, some abstract language. Let's say that we have a number of instructions, for instance, add, sub, mul, and they would do, of course, what you expect. So uh, if we wrote an interpreter, the general structure of an interpreter will be something that uh, writes the data out some, over some tape, over some memory, it's not important. And then it loops over, which is the D, of course, is the input. And then it loops over the instructions, or actually moves some instruction pointer. But let's say that it just uh, fetches the instructions over and over until it reaches the end of the program. So it reads the first instruction, or the nth instruction, if you will, and then it tries to decode that instruction and tries to understand if it can uh, evaluate that instruction. So in our case, let's say that the instructions have this structure. So first the opcode, add some more, and then the two, in our case, those two uh, uh, arguments. So it reads X, it reads Y. So once it decodes the instruction, let's say it reads add, right? It says, oh, the first part of the instruction is in Z, so I know how to evaluate this instruction among my cases. And so I know that it takes two arguments. So let's uh, read argument X, argument Y, and then it implements the semantics for that operation, which is plus, okay, doing the sum of them. And then it writes back the results somewhere, some variable, some area of memory, whatever, okay? That's pretty much it. I know that you know, but, you know it will get more complicated. So what about compilers? Well, compilers are, again, something, a program, that takes a program, again, as an input, because program, it is, it, it, it's data, right? So it takes a program as an input, that's called the source program, and then it generates what I call here CP, um, the object program. Um, so we, we sometimes forget uh, that there's this definition. It, it is used, in, especially for C compilers, they, they generate the object code. But we always call that compile code. But that's also no, another way to call it. So an object program, C of P. So the, comp the compiled version of, uh, of P through C. Okay, so now we have compiled a program and we have as a result something that is actually another program. And so we can evaluate that program, CP, over D, and that will give us back the results R, right? And we could denote this with C of P of D, okay? 
So let's say that we compile our sum, and uh, this is x86 instructions, very, very basic program. Well, what we will get is a couple of instructions, and really what it, what some, the, the one that really does the job is the, the first one. Not much to say, but yeah, I mean, that's how a compiler works. Now, something that I want you to reason a little bit about, um, there's no inherent property of a programming language that makes it a compiled or an interpreted language. There are some languages that are more suitable to one or the other, but there's no intrinsic reason why you cannot compile and interpret the same language. And in fact, there are some languages that actually ship both an interpreter and a compiler. Let's say ML, for instance, you can write an hello word and you can compile it or run it uh, directly. This is really important. The, the main point is um, I could compile the program or I could interpret it. The, 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 the property that stays is that the semantics, so the result uh, of applying the program to that input, that D, is the same result R. That's something that stands. So what is partial evaluation? Okay. So partial evaluation, let, let's give an intuitive version uh, of partial evaluation. Let's say we have our function f, and it has these two parameters, k and u. And now let's suppose that we want to call f very often with the value k equal to 5. So we bind k to 5. Okay, so uh, we could define a new function f5 that takes only u as a parameter, and it will always compute the function f5u, right? So f5u is uh, defined as f by substituting 5 for k and doing all possible computation based upon value 5. And, and the partial evaluation is the process of obtaining this f5. And this is the, are the diagrams that you can see in the, in, the, in the original paper. This is our program, and this is the FK version through partial evaluation. Now, by giving this, evalu this definition, you may, be, uh, you, may be, you may think uh, that you know that what I'm talking about is really another word, another definition for something that you may be familiar if you're a functional programmer or if you use techniques for doing functional programming. This is caring, right, or uh, some actually partial application, uh, sometimes those two are mixed up and I mix them up too, so don't ask me the difference right now. <laughs> but um, so what is the difference between partial, partial application and partial evaluation? So let's say we have the function f k of k and u, takes k and u as parameters, and it's defined in this very complicated way, but it's just an expression, mathematical expression, so k times, k times, k plus 1, plus u plus 1, plus u times u, okay? So the curing of this function, the partial application of this function to k equal to 5, and we call it 5, f5, would be a function that takes u and calls f5u. Okay, this will be the curried version. The, so the currying or partial application, um, partial application technique really doesn't change the text of the program. While partial evaluation does, by applying in this case uh, uh, um, a technique that's called simplification, what we do is not just uh, binding the parameter to the value that we want to keep, but we are going to simplify as much as possible the function until we obtain a function that is semantically equivalent to the first one. So it computes the same result, the same program, the same uh, function, but the text is different. So let's say k equal to 5, so it's 5 times 5 times 5 plus 1, so 6. 6 times 5 is 30. Pu u plus 1, I can sum 1 to 30, so it's 31. u times u. So the result is 5 times 31 plus u plus u times u. Okay, it's not the same function, it's a different function, but it computes the same, uh, the same result. Okay, this is simplification. There is another technique that's called the rewriting that sometimes uh, it's called also inlining um, or integration, I think. Um, and um, it, it's, uh, it's similar in that we are transforming the function. We're not, we're not just uh, uh, calling it with a different parameterization. We're really rewriting. Let's say we want to compute the power uh, of n to the fifth 
Uh, so n to the k, we want to bind k to 5, like just like in the previous example. So the, the fun, this is the simple definition of a power, uh, elevation to power uh, um, in, in a recursive way. So by doing the, the, sub, the rewriting mechanism, we first invoke pow, so we write pow 5n, so only the parameter n, pow n5. This is the first step. So what happened with pow n5 is that uh, 5 is, um, okay, 5 is greater than 0. So we're going to take the else branch. So we're going to rewrite it as n times pow n k minus 1, 5 minus 1, which is 4. Then we're going to do it the same, and then we're going to enter again the function, and then we're going to take again the else branch, and then gonna give me, that's going to give me n times power n3, and so on and so forth, until we can no longer expand it because we reached a fixed point, and uh, actually we, 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 don't, we no longer have any variables there, so uh, no, no bound variables. So we have the expansion of the power, so n times n five times. And that's how uh, we could we, we, we rewrite pow. So rewriting it's sometimes called uh, macro expansion. It's similar to macro expansion and sometimes called uh, procedure integration, in lining, beta reduction, depending on the context. And it's a very uh, familiar optimization technique of a compiler. Um, and it's often combi combined with simplification or constant folding. Uh, yeah, simplification is also called constant folding. Okay, um, let's go to projection. What is projection? Or what, what's the projection in the projection machine? So the following equation holds for f, k, and f. So let's say, um, so we expect that f with k applied to u, it's the same as f applied to k and u. And uh, if this holds, then f, k, f with k, it's called a projection of f at k. Are you still with me? It's, it's not that complicated so far. Okay, so what is a partial evaluator then? So a partial evaluator or a projection machine or a partial computer, it's a function, let's call it alpha, that takes our function f, the parameter that we want to bind, and gives you back the partial evaluation of that function at that point. So... Uh, yeah, so alpha of f and k gives us back f with k, okay? That's our, our uh, partial computer. Okay, so let's see it in action again. So we have our function f. We have our parameters k and u, and the results in f is f applied to k and u. So we take, uh, let's suppose that we want to bind, uh, we're going to fix the k parameter to some value. So we take f and the parameter k and we apply al alpha and we get as a result the projection of f at k. Okay. It's like, uh, because alpha, it's a, alpha, it's a program, it, 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 it exists. Alpha, it's not just a function, it's not just an abstraction, it's a program. So it's like if we had this program at hands, we could write this in our program. We say alpha, power, and then the binding of k at 5, and it gives us back not just the curing of f, but of pow in this case, but it gives us back the writing of this function. This is the partial evaluator. So the paper presents various use cases for this technique, but we're going to only focus today on automatically generating a compiler, which is really fascinating. So let's get back a little bit and recall our definitions for interpreters and compilers. An interpreter is a program, keeps this in mind. The program takes another program and the data as input and gives you back the results, and it evaluates the program. Yeah. A compiler is a program. So the program takes a source program as its parameter, as its argument, and returns an object program. And then this program that it has generated, the object program, processes the input and returns the result. Okay? All right. So an interpreter is a program, and P, of course, is a program. But uh, because I, uh, our interpreter is a program, we can apply partial evaluation. So let's suppose that we have our function alpha. And let's say that we want to bind p uh, in, in our in our function in our program i in our interpreter. 
So by applying alpha, we get i with p, the pro projection of i at p. So what's ip? Well, let's think about it a little bit. So ip, you remember this diagram, i was taking p and d gives you back r. So if I fix p to i, what I get back is this diagram. And in this diagram, what this diagram means is that I feed d into ip and I get r, right? So if by using ip and feeding d into ip I get r, then what I'm getting is an object program. So it's a compiled program. So by, from an interpreter, I got a compiled program. Are you still with me? <laughs> because this equation still holds because uh, IPD is equal to CPD, I, uh, alpha IP is still equal to I with P, and so I with P equals CP, okay? So this is the first projection. But if there's a first projection, we'll see. Uh, let's see why this work, how this work. So let's say that we have our interpreter program here, right? Um, and you recall that we saw this at the beginning. So uh, it has this Y loop and it decodes the instruction. So our program, uh, it's F, right? And, and we want to, we want to uh, fix our interpreter to this particular F program. So what happens here is, this, is the body of this program basically only contains the add instruction because, because that's all it does. So we know that there's only one instruction. We know that there's only one instruction of type add. So if we apply all the writings and reductions that we saw at the beginning, this program ends up being write D, use add, sum, and return. But this interpreter it's actually executed in a machine. And this was a compiled program. Our interpreter, we compiled it to run it somewhere. So it has some instructions in the, in the target architecture. So this is really this. So this is the compilation of F, right? So this is a compiled program. Now, this was the situation where we were a bit uh, a second ago, right? We fixed our I uh, to P through alpha, and we got I with P. Now let's um, let's rewrite this a little bit. So let's just uh, move the parameters around, and I'm I'm going to move uh, alpha here at the uh, in the middle, and uh, and having IMP on the left and IP on the right because I can do that right because alpha it's a program. So and my alpha it's a program that by being given I and P gives me IP right. Because the projection machine takes a program, one input of the program, and gives you back the new program that's bound to that parameter. But alpha itself, it's a program. So what if I bind alpha to i, and I get a by way of alpha, and I get alpha i? What is alpha i? So this is the second projection. So what is alpha i? What does alpha i do? Uh, well, uh, if, you, if you see this picture, uh, what we're really saying here is that it's equivalent, right? It's the same thing. It still produces ip. And ip, as we saw, it's an interpreter fixed at p. And it's a compiled version of p, right? So what this program does is alpha i, it's a program that by give, being given p, it gives you ip. But well, we just said that b, ip really is compiled p. It's the object program of P, so it's the compiled version of P. So what is a program that alpha i? So it's a program that by being given a program P gives us back the compiled version of P. What's that called? Compiler. A compiler. <laughs> it's a compiler. So by applying alpha twice to an interpreter, we get a compiler. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty interesting already. What does that mean in an abstract sense? It's, it's like if we have a description of a programming language, let's say the Python interpreter, you can see the, the Python interpreter as a description of the Python language. It's a weird description, if you will, because it's an implementation, but it is a description. It describes precisely what to do at every instruction of a program. So if you have a description of a, of a, of a language, 
through a compiler, you can get automatically the compiler for that language by applying partial application twice. But we need to go deeper. <laughs> so we are in this situation so far. So we have applied alpha to alpha and I, and we get alpha I, which is a compiler, because it gives us back IP, which is a, as a compiled version of P, uh, a compiler. So what if we, OK, rewrite this again? As you can see, I, alpha, and IP, we move it again around. And so we still have alpha I, alpha, and alpha I, which is equal to C, the compiled program, right? The compiler, sorry, compiler. So we have alpha at the middle, our partial evaluator. We have our partial evaluator and our I. And these two together gives us a compiler, right? But alpha is still a program. So I can apply alpha to alpha and alpha and get alpha alpha. So what's alpha? <laughs> what's alpha alpha in this case? So alpha alpha, it's a program, of course. And this program, uh, by being given I, gives us alpha I, which is a compiler, right? So alpha alpha is a program that by given I, the description of some language gives alpha I, which is a compiler. Alpha I transforms this program to an object program. Alpha I is a compiler. So Alpha Alpha is a program. The binding interpreter gives you a compiler. And that's sometimes called a compiler compiler, or in a layman's term, a compiler generator. So by being given an interpreter, I can generate a compiler for that language. So Alpha Alpha is a compiler generator. By being given an interpreter, I can fit it into Alpha Alpha and I get back a compiler for, for I. Like Python compiler. That's pretty cool. Can we go even deeper? <laughs> well, let's see. Uh, this is the situation that we have before. So we applied alpha, we got alpha, alpha. But if we go even deeper, we have this diagram. We have alpha and alpha on the left. We have alpha in the middle and alpha, alpha on the right. So we actually have reached a fixed point. A fixed point. If we apply alpha to alpha and alpha, of course, it gives it back again alpha, alpha. Now, one question you may, we, you may, uh, we, we may ask ourselves is, what is alpha alpha exactly? So we said that alpha with i uh, was a compiler for the language defined by i. So alpha alpha, so it means that alpha with something means that gives you a it's something, it's a generator, it's a generator for a compiler for that I, for that, for that uh, interpreter. So alpha in this context is both the partial evaluator and the, the with alpha, it's, a, it's an interpreter in some sense. It's a, it's a language description. So the question is, what is alpha? It's, a lang it's a, some sort of language. Alpha alpha is the compiler for the language alpha. In other words, by finding alpha alpha, we can generate F up, um, f projected at k for any f k. So if we are able to find alpha alpha, this is the fourth equation, uh, we have a partial evaluation compiler. So a general transformation that can be applied to any interpreter and gives you back a compiler for that language. <laughs> Uh, however, at least at the time of writing that paper, uh, there was no practical way to derive alpha alpha, but still, we got pretty, pretty deep uh, into, into the possibilities of, of all this. So why is this interesting? Why, what has this to do with GraalVM? Okay, so let's get back to our, to our original paper, Practical Partial Evaluation for High-Performance Dynamic Language Runtimes. So the way Truffle, which is the, 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 the framework through which you can write uh, dynamic programming languages uh, in, in an efficient way on, on GraalVM, is by leveraging uh, the Futamura projection. How does that work? Basically, um, yeah, so if you recall the problem that we had at the beginning was that if you want to write an efficient runtime, an efficient uh, compiler and interpreter from, for your language, is um, that you have uh, to replicate, to duplicate the semantics of the language, both in the interpreter and the runtime. And we wanted to avoid that, and the compiler, sorry. And we wanted to avoid that. So 
If we have a magical machine that is able to transform your interpreter into a compiler, then you can reuse a lot of code. And that is actually what happens through Truffle. You define an interpreter through an abstract syntax tree, which is actually one of the most high-level representation for the semantics of a language. You just describe your language in terms of a tree that really represents uh, the, the syntax in a manipulated and simplified way, but it's basically the syntax of your original program. In fact, the abstract syntax tree uh, can be easily retranslated into the source code. Not exactly the same source code that you had, but pretty much the same. And the power, this comes from the paper, uh, this picture, the power of Truffle is that it is able to speculate and transform part of the AST through partial evaluation into uh, efficient representation. And it can also, uh, un uh, un come back, get back in case of a, of a wrong, of a wrong uh, optimization, of wrong speculation, return back to the interpreted phase and then recompile it down into uh, a partially evaluated version for the new situation. And this is a very powerful mechanism uh, to, to obtain an interpreter, a compiler, by just writing an interpreter. So that's pretty cool. Futamura projections. And that's pretty much what I had for today. So if you want to learn more, there, this is a bunch of references. Um, thank you. If you have any questions. Are there any questions? We have 15 minutes. We can talk a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. Sure. So this one, right? Plain alpha. Plain alpha. It's a. It's the partial evaluator. So alpha. It's. Uh, it's the program that we use to bind a program, uh, to, to bind a parameter to an um, in a program. So it's really, really what we did at the beginning here. So what we did here manually by just looking at the code, right? It's, um, it's, it's our alpha. So the alpha, it's the program that is able to transform our, uh, an arbitrary program into an equivalent program that uh, computes the same function, I mean, the, uh, with the same semantics, with the same results, but by fixing some of the parameters. So in the case of an interpreter, for instance, it means that you are fixing that interpreter to that particular program. And so you are eliminating all of the statements that are not required to evaluate that program. And the same goes for a compiler. So you do it another time, so, and over and over. So that's the basic idea. Yes? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but when you compile it, that conversion is not occurring. Why? Right. The yeah, good, good, good question. Execution is a real problem. Yeah, good question. So uh, the, the question was, um, so if I have a pro so if I am partially evaluating a program, and of course programs can be arbitrarily complex, so I could do very complicated stuff. If I do partial evaluation, what I'm effectively doing is doing that computation at some point in time before actual execution in order to optimize the execution later. So if I'm computing, for instance, the Ackermann function, that could take a very long while. It will be very fast once I run it, but it could take a too much of a long time <laughs> To, to do it online, right? So uh, as far as I know, GraalVM uh, takes a trade-off. So they, they have a threshold and also, I think, some sort of timeout. And so if it's too long, then they will bail out. Or, um, uh, the paper is actually interesting. They, they propose a technique. Uh, I have eliminated that part because it's too, you know, goes over and over again. But um, in the beginning, in the abstract, they were talking about uh, tabulation technique which are not showing, but the tabulation technique, basically, uh, it's, a, it's the dual 
of memoization, if you, if you are familiar. So memoization is when you, every, every execution you do, you see a value and you see the results. You take a table, you take an hash map, for instance, and you keep that value around so that when you evaluate again the function with that value, you will just return the result immediately, which you can do uh, for pure functions, for instance. So functions that do not do output, for instance. Um, so the dual, in a way, it's tabulation. Um, while uh, memoization, you do it at runtime because you only look at the values that pass through the function at runtime. Tabulation, it's the same, but ahead of time at compile time. So because it's ahead of time, you do not see any values beforehand. So you just run it through all of the possible values. And of course, this may not be uh, convenient and it, may, and it definitely is not space efficient. So, depending on the kind of function you're computing, it may or may not be the right thing to do. So, of course, there's trade-offs. Yeah. Any other questions? Sure. Could you repeat again what roles uh, raw VM and truffle and the, the you know, JIT sure. compiler, what, how do they relate to alpha, alpha with alpha, and so on? All right, okay. So GraalVM, it's, uh, uh, it's a bit confusing the way the, 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 the name has been used uh, uh, lately, but GraalVM is kind of an umbrella pro of projects. So uh, the main project, I would say, is the just-in-time compiler. It's a just-in-time compiler that's written in Java, which is not something we've talked about today. Um, there's the native image compiler, which is another thing again. Uh, they reuse a lot of the infrastructures, all of them. Uh, what I've talked about today is Truffle. So when you hear about uh, the JavaScript programming language um, on top of GraalVM, Ruby, R, Python, and even native extensions, they work through Truffle. Um, and uh, I think if you are familiar with native image, you may have heard about, I think it's called Espresso, which is a way to run inside a native image Java bytecode. Those are, as far as I know, those are all based on Truffle. So Truffle is an API that you can implement to write an abstract syntax tree for a language of your choice. So let's say I want to implement Python. I'm going to create a grammar for Python, a parser for Python, and then I'm going to write all the possible syntactic uh, constructs translated into an abstract syntax tree. When I receive a Python program, I read the text source of the Python program, I translate it through a parser uh, into the abstract syntax representation for Truffle, and then I let Truffle do the evaluation of this abstract syntax tree. So um, the partial evaluation happens through Truffle when the runtime evaluates a program. So when you are evaluating your program here, when you're evaluating your program, um, it may happen that uh, the profiler recognizes that some part of your program are hot and some values are being used a lot of times. So instead of going through the, uh, the tree, because uh, so the way an, an interpreter, an AST based interpreter works is navigating the tree. So you just go through the tree, node by node. Instead of going through the tree every single time, what you really want to do is, let's say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to compute only uh, the sum for five. So I'm going to rewrite the tree, basically, in such a way that five is always a constant, that the one of the arguments for the sum is always a constant. So that's the picture that you see, uh, yeah, in the middle. And then this can be further improved uh, through partial evaluation uh, by generating actual compile code. And, and that's the partial evaluator. In Truffle, or at least uh, in this paper, I think they, they, they are able to do uh, the, the second projection. But uh, in this paper, they were talking about the first projection. So the first one that we saw. So uh, the first one that we saw was the first projection, which is the simplest of the of the four. And it's just uh, basically taking the interpreter and then applying it to the program. Where is it? There you go. So you get the object program, in this case, a part of the program, and you transform it into a compiled version of that program. So this is the first projection. You take an interpreter, an interpreter for a program. In our case, in the picture, we take a section of the program, which is still a program, and we apply a partial evaluation to that program by rewriting the program 
applying the transformation that we saw. And then uh, we, as a result, we obtain uh, a compiled version of the part of the code. Is that clear? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> First projection, yeah. First Truffle, first projection, yes. How far can you practically go today? I think you can practically go to the second projection, but I don't have further details. So right now, I don't have uh, references to give you. Uh, you don't, definitely cannot go to the fourth. <laughs> It is practically possible, yes. Yes. The, the four projection, though, I don't think it's possible uh, practically. Any other questions? Oh, yes. Okay, okay, I think I got the question. So, so the question is, um, so the premise is a compiled program is more efficient than an interpreted program, right? And you said, since you can generate a compiler automatically, how do you know whether this compiled, generated compiler is as efficient as a proper compiler, something like that? Okay. So I, I don't think I really have an answer to that. <laughs> uh, I, I would actually argue that possibly I'm not even sure about your premises, though, because I'm not even sure. It depends on the compiler whether a compiled version of a program is actually as more efficient than an interpreter program. Sometimes translating in a blind way an, an, an interpreted uh, a program into a compiled program in a in a very you you know trivial way uh, could result in a program that may be even slower than interpreter because the translation is too trivial. So I I, I don't have a direct answer to that. Um, yeah, I cannot give you. But I don't know if there are theoretical results, honestly. Right. <laughs> um, what's the purpose, you say? Yeah. Well, of course, it depends on the interpreter and the compiler. So um, this is a generic technique that you can apply to any kind of interpreter uh, to, to obtain a, a, a compiled version of that interpreter. Then this is a theoretical result. So it varies depending on what you're actually, actually doing. Um, you, you have an implement, so, so for a lot of years after this theoretical result from Futamura were presented, uh, Futamura uh, partial evaluation was uh, considered a very abstract and theoretical machine or, or, or result. And there were a lot of attempts to use it, use it practically. Uh, the GraalVM project showed that the results by doing proper numbers, because they are properly evaluating and benchmarking their results against, uh, you know, real-world implementation and on hand-rolled, that this technique paired with thresholds and, uh, you know, speculative techniques, profiling, online profiling, can be effective. So that, that's the answer that I can give you. We, we can take this offline anyway. I think we don't have any more time or? We have five minutes. Oh, we have five minutes. Any other questions? I think it is. Actually, well, I don't think it is applicable directly in the JIT specifically, in the JIT of the JVM, 
What I can tell you is that both the, you know, at the top there's the C, C++ languages, and uh, there is not here in the picture because it's a recent project, and this is an old uh, slide, but uh, there is this Espresso uh, project that um, interprets bytecode of the JVM through an interpreter that runs on top of the JVM. And what it does is optimizing the bytecode by rewriting it through the, the truffle interpreter. What, it, what happens in the, here in C, C++ are, and uh, the, these, these area there, uh, what, they, what, it, what this means is that uh, there's a project, there's a sub-project, uh, uh, an interpreter for truffle that's called Sulong that is able to interpret LLVM bitcode. So LLVM, it's a compiler framework and it translates your programs to a native representation, but it also translates your program into uh, an internal representation that's called the bitcode, which is similar to the bytecode, not by chance. And what GraalVM is able to do is interpret the bitcode, but through their uh, mechanism, they're able to make it an efficient, uh, uh, an efficient runtime evaluation. So it can be applied in a way, yeah. Uh, even though it's not integrated in, the, I don't know if it's integrated directly in the JVM JIT that they implement though. Okay, I think we're good. Thank you.